1 Corinthians is our book of study at the moment. We have been working our way through this book chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and so we arrive today at the very end of chapter 14. We have talked about spiritual gifts, we've talked about how we use them, and we're kind of wrapping up Paul's thoughts on the use of spiritual gifts this morning. As we prepare to do that, let's pray. Father, we come now to your precious holy word, and we recognize that it is not the intellect of human beings that is our authority, it is you. Specifically, Father, it is your will expressed to us through your word. And so I ask, Father, that this morning you would set me aside and that you would communicate the truth of your word to your people through your Holy Spirit, that I would simply be a tool and an instrument used by you to declare it. Father, I pray that we would walk out these doors this morning changed because we have had an encounter with the Word of God today. We thank you and we praise you knowing that you have incredible things in store for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it has taken us a bit of work to get through this final section of 1 Corinthians 14. This, the title this morning is To Avoid Confusion. And as you see there, it is part three. Originally, we were going to do this whole thing in one part, and God said, no, we need three parts. So here we are, part three, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 36 to 40. By way of reminder, again, Paul is dealing with spiritual gifts. In chapter 12, he began this topic, and in chapter 12, he presented the purpose of spiritual gifts. What is the purpose of spiritual gifts? It is to build and bond the body of Christ. In chapter 13, we saw the priority of spiritual gifts. What is the priority? The priority is love. And Paul pointed out to the Corinthians in that chapter that some of the things they were prioritizing were going to pass off the scene. And so here in chapter 14, Paul's point is the practice of spiritual gifts. How do we use them? What does that look like when we're using our spiritual gifts? And we've seen that we want to communicate, we want God's word to convict through the use of our gifts, and we want to be clear. So today, as we finish chapter 14, we're looking at to avoid confusion. And this comes from verse 33, which tells us that God is not the author of confusion. Okay? Three things we mentioned last week with this idea of confusion. When tongues are practiced improperly, there is confusion. There is a right way and a wrong way to use tongues in Paul's day. And as we noted, we believe tongues have ceased, and so it's, that gift is not in operation today. Does that mean that God cannot give someone the ability to speak in a language they've never studied? No, it doesn't mean that. What it means is that the gift, like we see it in the book of Acts, like we see it here in 1 Corinthians, that is no longer in operation today. We noted that when prophets speak improperly and out of turn, there is confusion. Paul lays out for us, this is how someone is to exercise the gift of prophecy. And we noted also that now, since we have the completed word of God, this is what anyone who has the gift of prophecy should be doing, is explaining the, and teaching the word of God. And then we noted that when men and women reject the role and place God has given to them, there is confusion. If any of those things spark your interest, you can go back in online and, and listen to where we have been. We have a principle today, and that is that the best solution to confusion is focus and clarity. How do we achieve that? We have some guidance. To avoid confusion, we're given three priorities, and these priorities lead us to an outcome. Lives are changed when communication is clear. So what we've been doing over the last three messages in 1 Corinthians is talking about how do we avoid confusion, these three priorities. And the first was that to maintain proper order. That is the first priority. Maintain proper order. We're not going to rehash these verses, 26 to 33, um, but that is the point that we made in those. The second priority is that we need to maintain proper roles. We need to understand and maintain proper roles. To do that, we must understand the roles in verse 34. 
we noted that men and women have different roles and functions because that's what God has given to them. We're going to be most fulfilled and satisfied in Christ when we function within our God-given role. And so we noted that embracing your God-given role is about obedience to Christ. We place ourselves under his authority and we function as he has directed. And only when we do this do we have peace, joy, and fulfillment. It is not an easy thing to do, but it is a necessary thing. So we need to understand this to maintain proper roles. We need to understand the roles. Secondly, we need to understand the responsibility. And what we noted in verse 35 is that I am responsible for my own obedience. I cannot obey for you. You cannot obey for me, right? We are responsible for ourselves. And so don't try to be responsible for someone else, okay? Stay in the role that God has given you and trust him. So these three priorities, number one, maintain proper order. Number two, maintain proper roles. Today, what we're going to look at is maintain proper humility. Everyone's favorite topic, humility, right? Everyone just loves to eat a big slice of humble pie. Am I right? It's just, it is your favorite dish or dessert. No one likes to do that. We don't like humility, but humility is necessary if we're going to use our gifts to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ and to the good of the body of Christ. As we look at this point, we're going to talk about an Old Testament story, a story in the Bible, that has always frustrated me. And so if you're interested in what Old Testament story has always frustrated Pastor John, even if you're not, go with me to Numbers chapter 20. So whether you're curious or not, this is where we're going. Numbers chapter 20. So way back at the beginning, Numbers chapter 20, this is a story in the life of Moses. The children of Israel are coming out of Egypt. Moses is leading them, and something happens. They start grumbling and complaining for about the five millionth time. That's an exaggeration. The point is they were grumbling and complaining a lot. And so Moses reacts to their grumbling and complaining. The situation is they need water. And this is what happens. Numbers chapter 20, beginning there in verse 7. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus, you shall bring uh, water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels! Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me, to hollow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. This was the water of Mirabah, because the children of Israel contended with the Lord, and he was hollowed among them. Now you might be sitting there thinking, well, Pastor John, why did that passage frustrate you? Well, for years I looked at this and I said, here's Moses faithfully leading the people of Israel and all they do is whine and complain and tell him what a horrible job he's doing and he makes one little mistake and boom, he can't go into the promised land. And for years I thought to myself, that's not fair, right? The problem is I didn't understand the issue. Do you notice what Moses says? Must we get you water from this rock? We. Moses had no part, no ability to bring water forth from the rock. It was all of God. Not only did he try to take credit for something that God was going to do, he didn't listen to what God told him to do. God said, speak to the rock. He hit it twice. Moses disobeyed God and tried to take God's glory for himself. Isaiah 42, verse 8, God says this, I am the Lord, 
that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. God absolutely will not share his glory. This has a specific and important meaning when it comes to the use of spiritual gifts. We have to be humble. We have to use our gifts as God tells us to. Not, like Moses, do our own thing and lift ourselves up. God is the one who is at work through our gifts. It is not us. So how do we maintain proper humility? We have to fulfill two requirements. Requirement number one, establish authority. Establish authority. A big part of humility is submitting ourselves to authority. The question we have to ask is, who is our authority? And that is part of Paul's point in verse 36. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 36. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 36. Or did the word of God come originally from you? Or was it only, or was it you only that it reached? What Paul is saying to them is, you're practicing and believing something different, so something is disconnecting here, right? In verses 34 and 35 that we looked at last week, when it deals with the role of men and women in the church, that is kind of parenthetical, right? It's, it's kind of an aside. And here in verse 36, Paul returns to the idea in verse 33, God is not the author of confusion. He's the author of peace in all the churches. And so this idea of in all the churches is what Paul is referring back to. Here's what he's saying to the Corinthians. All the other churches observe what Paul is saying. Only the Corinthian church doesn't. So we have two options. Either the Corinthian church is getting it wrong or else everybody else in the body of Christ is getting it wrong. That's what Paul is saying. If everyone else is wrong he's saying to the Corinthians, then you must have a different word of God. That's what he's saying. This is a question of authority. It's a question of authority. What he's saying is that the tongue speaker or the prophet are not the authority for the local church. The word of God is our authority. How do we know that the word of God is our authority in the church? Second Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, so I took you to the beginning, now I'm taking you to the end. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 19 to 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, 19 to 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 19. Peter writes, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The first line in this in verse 19 would be better translated. We also have a more sure prophetic word. Peter has just been talking about how he and James and John were on top of the mountain. They saw Jesus glorified before them. And he says, look, you need to know that the word of God is more reliable than that experience. The word of God is more reliable than any experience that we can have. Any experience that we can have. The word of God is what we listen to. Why? He, se- he tells us. Because it didn't come from men. It didn't come from a group of men. There wasn't a collaborative effort around creating the word of God. It came from God himself. The word of God was given by God to men through the Holy Spirit. Therefore, this is our authority. We are not our own authority. This is very important because this is what our society teaches You are your own authority. You have your truth. Live by your truth. God's word says this is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, right? This is the truth. We submit ourselves to this. This does not submit to this or to this, right? 
God's word is not subject to my heart or my mind. I am to submit myself to the word of God. Paul's reminding the Corinthians, we submit to the word of God. God's word did not come from us. It's not ours alone. The Corinthian church has been facing division. We've seen that all through the book. Is there division in the body of Christ today? Yes, there is, right? All we need to do is look at a list of denominations to know there's division in the body of Christ, right? Where does some of this division come from? Some of it comes from us coming up with our own interpretations of Scripture instead of submitting ourselves to what God's Word has said. What Paul has written came from God, he's telling them, not from you. He says, it didn't come from you, it was revealed to Paul, not to them. And so what he's saying is the order that I've given you, how you are supposed to conduct yourselves in the church comes from God. And other churches are observing it. Look at verse 37. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. In a nutshell, what Paul is saying is if someone claims to be a prophet or if they claim to be a spiritually mature person, they are going to agree with what I have said. (laughs) That's what Paul says. Why? Because these things come from God. These things come from God. This is not Paul's opinion. It is the inspired word of God. Paul is saying this is a test. If you're really a mature believer, if you're really someone gifted by God to speak to the church, do you submit to the word of God? Because if you don't, then you're not speaking from God. You have to submit to the word of God. Are they under the authority of God's word? Those in the Corinthian church were not. They were rejecting what Paul had taught. They were rejecting what the other church churches practiced they were rejecting what god's word had revealed so here's the bottom line you cannot deny god's word and be a mature believer can't do it doesn't work god's word is our authority god's word is clear about how we are to use our spiritual gifts god's word is clear about the roles of men and women in the church if we reject what god has revealed in his word If we do not humble ourselves and submit to the authority of Scripture, we are immature. Let me say that again. If we reject what God has revealed in His Word, if we do not humble ourselves and submit to the authority of Scripture, we are immature. Verse 38. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 38. He says, But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. This word ignorant is the Greek word agnoeo, and it means to not know, to disregard, to refuse to acknowledge. This word appears twice in this one verse. The only difference between the two usages is that the first time it's what's called an indicative, and the second time it's an imperative. Basically, what that means is that the first use of ignorant is descriptive, it's describing someone. The second use is a command, right? Something to do. After looking at the Greek, here's what I would suggest as an interpretation of this verse. But if anyone disregards scripture, let them be disregarded. That's what Paul is saying. If you don't listen to scripture, we're not going to listen to you. That is what Paul is presenting. Failure to acknowledge that what Paul has written comes from God will lead that person to not being confirmed or acknowledged as a prophet or a spiritually mature person. Basically, if you disregard scripture, you are disregarded. Why? Because people are not our authority. Okay? Teachers, no matter how eloquent or persuasive, teachers are not our authority. The Holy Spirit, God breathed, the Word of God, the Scriptures, this and this alone is our authority. Okay? God alone determines how our gifts are to be used. That is the point that Paul is making. When we're going to use our spiritual gifts, we use them in submission to Christ, which means we use them as Christ has commanded. Any violation of what God has revealed in his word marks an illegitimate use of spiritual gifts. 
If we don't use our gifts how God says to use them, we're using them wrongly. Okay? So here is our lesson for these verses. Humility means that we use our gifts at God's direction and for his purpose. <clears throat> Would you read that with me, please? Humility means that we use our gifts at God's direction and for his purpose. Is this how we are using our spiritual gifts? If we're going to avoid confusion, we have to use our gifts how God has commanded. This requires that we have proper humility. How do we have proper humility? We fulfill these requirements. Number one, we establish authority. Number two, we establish boundaries. We establish boundaries. How do you stay humble? You have boundaries. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 39. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak with tongues. When Paul says to desire earnestly to prophesy, it's a command. Okay? In verse 5, he said that prophecy brings conviction to unbelievers and praise to God. In verses 24 and 25, Paul declared that prophecy brings conviction to the unbelievers. Sorry, I said that already. Uh, it, so, oh, in verse 5, he said it's better to speak in prophecy than to speak in tongues. Right? He said it's better to prophesy than to speak in tongues. For those reasons and more, Paul says you need to strive to prophesy. Prophecy is the proclamation and explanation of the word of God. That is what builds up the body of Christ. So he says, do not forbid, right? So he says, desire to prophecy, prophesy, and then he says, do not forbid to speak in tongues. This also is a command. The way this is worded implies to us that there were some in the Corinthian church who were saying, well, look, the way people are speaking in tongues and the way that they're prophesying is causing all kinds of problems. Let's just ban those two gifts. That was their solution. Now, do we have people who have that same solution to problems today? Well, if there's conflict, just ban it, right? Get rid of it. Just don't even do it. That's not God's solution. God's solution is do it the right way, right? Do it the right way. And so that's what Paul is saying. He says, don't forbid speaking in tongues. Remember, he tells us how speaking in tongues is supposed to be done in 1 Corinthians 14. And we believe from 1 Corinthians 13 that by the time the word of God was, was written, completed, speaking in tongues was done. Okay? So for us today, there is no gift of speaking in tongues. It's not legitimate for the church today. There are boundaries. Paul says, desire prophecy. Don't forbid to speak in tongues. There's boundaries that we don't cross. At the time Paul wrote this, prophets were still receiving direct revelation from God, and others were being given the supernatural ability to speak in languages they had never studied. Just clarification, the gift of tongues, biblically speaking, is always a known, recognized language that is spoken somewhere in the world. It is never unintelligible gibberish. Okay? It is always a known and recognized language every time we see it in Scripture. So because these were gifts given by the Holy Spirit for that time, it would be dangerous and sinful to completely forbid their use. Okay? That's what Paul is saying. For us today, we must recognize that those gifts have ceased, as made clear by 1 Corinthians 13. Well, God can still give the supernatural ability to speak in languages, and he can reveal things to people as he wills, those miracles are different than the gifts described here. The boundaries laid out in God's word must be recognized and honored. Gifts that have ceased have ceased. We have to submit ourselves to that. However, the cessation of those gifts in no way limits God's ability to do whatever he wants. Okay? God can do whatever he wants. Please, let's all agree on that. Right? Can God do whatever he wants? Okay, good. We do not place limitations on God. However, we must recognize the limits that he has placed, which is what we see here. He does not give the gifts of prophecy and tongues as he once did. God has placed a boundary on those gifts, and we must recognize and submit ourselves to the boundary that he has given. Having explained everything about spiritual gifts and how they are to be used, Paul gives his blessing on prophecy and speaking in tongues. However, 
there is one more boundary that he gives. Look at verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. Several things to unpack here. First, the word let. Let is a middle or passive imperative. And here's what that means. Paul is commanding the Corinthians to make sure that everything done by them or by others in the church is done decently and in order. It's a command. Secondly, this is what that means as a command is that's not optional, right? The second important thing here is all things. Everything done in and by the church is to be done decently and in order. Everything. Everything. Thirdly, everything is to be done decently. Decently means becomingly, decorously, in a manner characterized by propriety in manners and conduct. The church, the body of Christ, is called to behave with good manners and good conduct. Right? The world should never look at the church and find us embracing or excusing things like sexual immorality, dishonesty, hypocrisy, gossip, anything else that is contrary to the word of God and the character of Christ. We don't excuse that behavior. Our behavior is to be decent. Finally, we look at the words in order. In means according to, and order is the idea of one at a time. Now remember, he said earlier, if you're going to speak in tongues for that time in which he was writing, you do it in order. If you're going to prophesy, you do it in order. All things are to be done decently and in order. The idea here is that because God is not a God of confusion, we do things in an orderly fashion. Our services are not supposed to be chaos, okay? When someone comes into a church service, it's not supposed to be chaotic. Now, there's a balance to this. Our services should also not be dry, boring affairs, Okay? We want to find balance. We want to have something that is engaging and exciting, but is also in order and decent. Right? We have to find that balance. If, we cannot, if something cannot be done with decency, if it violates church order, Paul's saying don't do it. This is our boundary. This is how we stay humble. Pride crosses boundaries. We must be careful to take verse 40 in its context. Over the years, I have heard this verse, let all things be done decently and in order, ripped out of its context and used to, to justify statements like, well, this is why drums are, are evil, because all things need to be decently and in order. That is a misapplication of this verse, okay? Or I've heard it say, well, all things need to be done decently and in order, so you have to dress modestly. That has nothing to do with this verse, okay? There's other it, scriptures that address those things that this verse does not this all things here is the context of the local church in the exercise of spiritual gifts there must be decency and order our behavior must align with a good testimony of christ now there is a starting place for this okay we're talking about spiritual gifts gifts given by the holy spirit there is something that you have to do in order to get a spiritual gift. You have to have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You cannot have a spiritual gift if you don't know the giver of the spiritual gift. You can't have the character of Christ if you don't know Christ. Okay? And so part of what Paul is saying is he's writing these people and he's challenging them too with this idea. Do you know Jesus? Right? What does Scripture say? Scripture says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In our culture today, we don't like this word sin. We don't like the idea that we have done anything wrong. But all of us would also admit that we're not perfect, right? But what is the standard? God's standard is perfection. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The penalty for sin is death. See, Every, every time we break a rule, there is a punishment for the breaking of that rule. God, as a just, righteous, and holy God, has to have consequences. When we break God's law, the consequence is death. 
eternal separation from God. Okay? So, the penalty for sin is death. But, I'm so thankful that there is a second part to this verse. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The free gift of God is eternal life. Wow! How do I get that? You have to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, and you will be saved. This is the gospel. We're going to get there in 1 Corinthians 15, eventually, all right? This is the gospel. It's what you stand in. It's what saves you. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's what we have to believe. That is what gives you a spiritual gift. That is what gives you the ability to have the character of Christ. This is the starting point. And so if you're sitting here and you're saying, Pastor John, this is all just, I don't get any of it. Please trust in Jesus as your Savior. Don't go out these doors saying, eh, maybe later. You know, I'm just not ready for that. We sing, I don't know, I don't know about tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen. We only have this moment to place our faith in Jesus Christ. So if you've never done that, please do that. Don't go out of here not having trusted in him. Paul is saying to the Corinthians, we don't want a chaotic meeting. <laughs> This is what Paul has in view. This is why we recognize God-given boundaries. And so our lesson in these verses is this. Humility means that we identify and submit to the boundaries God has given. Would you read that with me, please? Humility means that we identify and submit to the boundaries God has given. Are we willing to do that? Whenever the church meets, this is the goal. We want to avoid confusion. And as we look back over this entire section in chapter 14, there's two things that stand out to me. The first is this. The purpose of the church gathering is to build up the body of Christ. That's why we get together. Because that is true, we preach and teach the word of God. Okay? We do not teach the opinions of men. After all, this is what Paul told Timothy. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Paul didn't say to Timothy, Timothy, get people excited. Timothy, give people your opinion. Timothy, preach the word and be ready to preach the word all the time, in season and out of season, when it's convenient and when it's not. And when you're preaching the word, Timothy, convince, persuade people, rebuke, right? That's correction. Exhort, encourage them with all long suffering and teaching. This is what we do. As we do this, as we sing praises to our God, as we fellowship with one another, as the word is preached, the body of Christ is built up. We see that in this section. Secondly, we represent Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is imperative that we reflect his character. What is the character of Christ? Thank you for asking. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Personally and individually, we submit to the Holy Spirit and he produces his fruit in our lives. The more this fruit is produced, the more Christ is seen in us. To be effective in the Christian life, to communicate the gospel clearly, humility is required. If we are like Moses trying to take credit for what only God can do, we will never be effective for Christ. Our responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ is to build one another up. This here is to be a place of strengthening and encouragement. That encouragement and strength is produced when each member of the body is using their gifts for God's glory and the church's good. We submit to the authority of Scripture. We submit to the boundaries God has given. And God then uses us for His glory. Let's talk, talk application for just a moment. On a personal level, if you want to have an interesting study, go to Proverbs and look at what it says about pride. 
Pride makes us unusable to God. In our personal lives, we need to pursue humility. Maybe a commitment here would be to see ourselves as God word, God's word reveals us to be. In our relationships, do any of us love being around someone who is prideful? Anyone? Do you want just be like, man, I hope I get to hang out with someone who's just full of themselves? Anyone at all? Okay, I didn't think so. Why not? Because pride isolates us from others. Pride isolates us from others. We cannot make a difference for Christ if people avoid us, okay? Maybe a commitment here would be to ask a friend if we have any areas of pride in our lives. So personal, relational, let's talk about parenting for a second. It is okay to be proud of your children. That is okay. However, we need to be proud of them regardless of their performance, If we are only proud of our children when they do good in sports, when they get a good grade, when they get whatever it might be, what we are teaching them is that acceptance is earned. That's what we're teaching them. Acceptance is not earned. Okay? We need to be proud of who they are, not just what they do. We need to demonstrate that they are loved and accepted regardless of performance. Why? Because that is how our God loves us us marriage be proud of your spouse i don't care what hang-ups or or hold-ups or whatever it is that they have there is always something to be proud of so look for it in your spouse and once you have found it tell them about it and repeat it to yourself because what that will do is it will help you maintain a good relationship All right, let me give you just a few moments to write down a commitment there in the lines provided, and then we'll finish up. We're going to close with four statements, and with each of these statements, there's a question that I want you to ponder. Statement number one. The church gathers to build one another up. Okay, that's the statement. Here's the question. And we're all going to ask ourselves these questions. Who will I build up? Who will I build up? Statement number two. Anything that tears believers down must be ruthlessly eliminated. Question. What do I need to tear out of my life? Statement number three, our gifts are unique and purposefully given. Question, how will I use my gift in the church? How will I use my gift in the church? Finally, growth only happens as we submit to our triune God and his word. Question, will I submit to him? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that in these pages are given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Everything we need is right here. All that is required of us is to submit ourselves to what you have revealed. And I pray that each one of us would do that. That I would not try to do that for someone else for my spouse or my children or church members, but that I would submit myself to you and you alone and that each one of us would walk in obedience to you. Thank you, Father. I pray that this week everything we do, everything we say, and everything we think would bring praise and honor and glory to you and your name. We pray this in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen.